Okay, so we're going to look at a very special type of triangle where the circumference of the incircle is equal to one of the side lengths. So the incircle of a triangle, this is the biggest possible circle that you can fit inside your triangle, and it's also tangent to all three sides of a triangle. So we're looking for triangles where the circumference of this circle is equal to at least one of the side lengths. There's a really simple way of seeing that such triangles exist. You can imagine that if we say that this side is the one where we want the length of this to be equal to the circumference of the incircle. We know it has to be tangent to the incircle, so we could just draw on top a circle with the appropriate circumference equal to this side length. Then it's just a simple matter of drawing in our remaining two sides so that they're also tangent to our incircle. Then we formed one of these triangles. And we could draw this circle in other locations as well to give us other such triangles where the circumference of the incircle is equal to one of the side lengths. The only issue with this construction is actually if we were to take our circle and place it really, really close to the edge, it is possible that our two lines, which are tangent to the incircle, could actually go off in different directions and never meet. So it doesn't always guarantee us such a triangle. What's really going on here is if we were to extend our lines going in both directions, then you'd see that the lines do meet and they do form a triangle. The only issue being here, what we thought was going to be our incircle turns out to be actually outside of the triangle. So this construction doesn't always work. And what we're going to do is actually try and find a nice way of classifying all of these special triangles with this property. So one simplifying assumption we'll make is just that the radius of our inner circle is going to be 1, then we could expand or contract our triangle to cover all the different possible cases. So if the radius of the inner circle is 1, its circumference is 2 pi, then again, without any sort of loss of generality, we could assume that one of our sides is going to be this line segment on the x-axis between pi and minus pi, with length 2 pi. Then, because our circle has to be tangent to this side length, we know that the circle is going to lie somewhere between pi and minus pi. And we can imagine rolling this along, we could start off here, the radius has been chosen to be 1, and we could move this left and right so that the centre lies between positive and negative pi. So we say that the centre has coordinates, x-coordinate u and the y-coordinate is just 1, and we'll have a look at, can we find a nice way of finding the coordinates of our third point on this triangle as a function of u? And we'll also try and work out which values of u this is valid for. So how far along can our circle go before we potentially end up in this scenario where we don't get a triangle? So how will we find the coordinates of this third point in our triangle? Well, the approach we'll take is we'll try to find the equation of these two lines which form the other two sides in our triangles we'll call these L1 and L2, then we just need to find the intersection of L1 and L2. The coordinates of this intersection tells us what our third point is. We want this all as a nice function of u. So to find the equation of L1, instead of going with the y equals mx plus c approach, we'll write this as y minus y1 is equal to the gradient m1 into x minus x1. So here x1, y1, this is just the coordinates of any point on our line. So you can show that this format works as so your gradient is equal to your change in y divided by change in x, essentially. So we know one point which lies on L1. This is the point where x is minus pi and y is just 0. So we can substitute this in as our x1, y1, get y minus 0 is equal to m1 times x minus minus pi, so x plus pi. And later we'll find what the gradient actually is. Then similarly for L2, we'll use this format y minus y2 is equal to m2, x minus x2, where x2, y2 is a point on our line. So again, we can use x is pi, y is 0. So we get y minus 0 is equal to m2 times x minus pi now. So this is the format for each of our equations of the lines. You'll notice here that the format is actually independent of u, that the gradient is going to depend on u as this varies, as we'll see. So first we'll find the gradient of the line L1. And to find the gradient, we're going to work with some of the relevant angles in this picture. So the angles are going to be really helpful, because if you have a right angle triangle like this, let's say this angle is alpha, and the gradient of the diagonal here, your change in y divided by your change in x, this is also just the opposite divided by the adjacent in this triangle, so your gradient is just going to be tan alpha. So then we can use this on our picture. I've split these up in half, so we've got two copies of theta. Essentially, to find the value of the gradient for L1, we just need to find the value of tan 2 theta. So why have I split this angle in half? Well, 
We're making use of the circle theorem here, which tells you that if you've got two tangents to a circle drawn like this, so that they meet on the outside of your circle, we can draw in the radii here, so these have the same length, we've got a right angle here and here, your radius and tangent meet at 90 degrees. If we also draw in this line going from the centre to this point, you actually have two congruent triangles because this side is shared, so you have two sides the same and the right angle, so we do indeed get two copies of the same angle, which we're calling theta here. So we can split this in half like this, and it turns out to be much nicer to find the value of tan theta than to find the value of tan 2 theta, although tan 2 to theta is what we're looking for for the gradient. So how do we find the value of tan theta? Well, if I just copy out a smaller triangle which just has theta in it, and we know that this is going up to the centre, so the centre is at height 1, so the opposite side length is 1, we can also work out this adjacent length. So this is going from minus pi to u along the x-axis. The distance is just going to be u minus minus pi, or u plus pi. And this is nice because it works even if u is negative. u plus pi will be the length even if we go to the left of the y-axis there. So then we can just read off that tan theta is equal to 1 over u plus pi. But we need the value of tan 2 theta to tell us our first gradient. So we can say that m1 our gradient of interest is tan 2 theta. So we can just use the double angle formula for tan. So this is 2 tan theta all over 1 minus tan squared theta. And if we substitute in 1 over u plus pi, we get 2 times 1 over u plus pi all over 1 minus 1 over u plus pi all squared. Then if we multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by u plus pi all squared, we get a slightly nicer expression. 2 into u plus pi divided by u plus pi all squared minus 1. So this is our gradient of L1. To find the gradient for L2 we'll use the similar approach. The only difference here is our triangle is the opposite way round and the gradient is actually decreasing. So instead of being interested in the value of tan 2 phi we would need the value of minus tan 2 phi to tell us the gradient of L2. It's really interesting here as well, if 2 phi happened to actually be an obtuse angle, this formula would also work, you can check if you're interested. And similarly, for our calculations before, if 2 theta happened to be obtuse, this would also still work. So we're going to work just like before, try and first find the value of tan phi, then use the double angle formula for tan. So to find the value of tan phi, we can draw a picture like this. We know that the distance from the point at u to the centre of our circle, we've chosen the radius to be 1, so we know this distance is 1, and we know this distance here is just going from pi to u, so this is pi minus u, and then just by choice this is our angle phi here. So you know that tan phi is going to be 1 over pi minus u, so then we know that tan 2 phi is going to be 2 tan phi over 1 minus tan squared phi, then we can substitute in our values here. We're interested in, you know, m2 is the negative of tan 2 phi. So then substituting in, we get negative 2 times 1 over pi minus u. Then all of this divided by 1 minus 1 over pi minus u all squared. Then we can just deal with the negative as well as multiplying by pi minus u all squared on the top and bottom. So this gives us just doing it all in one quick step, 2 into u minus pi to get rid of the negatives on the top, and then instead of writing it as pi minus u all squared, I'll just rewrite this as u minus pi all squared minus 1 in the denominator. So this is our gradient now, L2. Now that we've found the equations of L1 and L2, we just need to solve simultaneously to find the coordinates of the point where they intersect. So we set the two y coordinates equal to each other, we get this equation which we can now solve to find the value of x. So we can get rid of the factors of 2 here, then we'll cross multiply by the denominators of each side. So we have u minus pi all squared minus 1 multiplied by u plus pi and x plus pi. So this is our new left hand side and this is equal to the denominator u plus pi all squared minus 1 multiplied now by u minus pi x minus pi. What I'm going to do next is actually expand the brackets partially for each side, then we'll get some terms which you can factor together. So if we expand with this u minus pi all squared times u plus pi times x plus pi, I'm just going to write this as u minus pi, u minus pi, u plus pi, x plus pi. So this is our 
first term from expanding this bracket, but we also have the minus 1 times u plus pi x plus pi as well, don't forget. So we have minus u plus pi x plus pi. Then this is all equal to, if we do the same thing on the other side, and again we'll write this in this slightly strange u plus pi times u plus pi expanded form, multiplied by u minus pi x minus pi, then we also take away the minus 1, so minus u minus pi x minus pi. And the reason I've expanded these is you can see then we have a u plus pi and a u minus pi term, which is actually common to both of these four term expressions. So what we'll do is take this one over onto the left hand side and we'll also take this negative term from the left hand side, add this, so we take this onto the right hand side. So our next line in our working is just going to be, we'll have this common factor u minus pi u plus pi, so I'll write u plus pi u minus pi. Then we have a large bracket now u minus pi x plus pi from our left hand side. Then we also need to take away the u plus pi x minus pi contribution. So take away u plus pi x minus pi. Okay, so this is everything that we're going to keep on the left hand side. Then we take this term and add this to the right hand side, so we end up with now the right hand side is just u plus pi x plus pi minus this term is left alone, so u minus pi and x minus pi. Now we're ready to expand some of the brackets and see what cancels. So first of all, this u plus pi, u minus pi, we'll write this as a difference of two squares, u squared minus pi squared. Now if we start to expand all the brackets here, we get ux minus pi x plus u pi minus pi squared. Then we're going to take away a ux plus pi x minus u pi minus pi squared. So you can see here some of the terms cancel the ux and the minus ux, also the minus pi squared cancels with minus minus pi squared. And the pi x and u pi terms are related but they don't quite cancel. Then similarly we expand on the right hand side now so we get ux plus pi x plus u pi plus pi squared. Then we're also going to take away now ux minus pi x minus u pi plus pi squared. So once again our ux terms cancel with each other and our pi squared cancel with our minus pi squared term. So now we can simplify this quite substantially. The left hand side we get u squared minus pi squared. So this is now being multiplied by we've got a minus pi x and another minus pi x. So it's just two lots of minus pi x. Then there's also a u pi and a minus minus u pi. So again two lots of positive u pi. So this is our new left hand side, and this is equal to our new right hand side just becomes 2 times pi x plus u pi. So this is nice, our factors of 2 cancel from both sides. What's even nicer here is there's actually a factor of pi common to all of the terms, so we can get rid of all of these pi's here just dividing through by pi, and now we can finally write this all on one line. So u squared minus pi squared into, we've just got minus x plus u left there, and this is equal to x plus u. So now we want to find the value of x, so let's take all of our x terms onto the right hand side, make x the subject, so we're left with x, and if we add a copy of u squared minus pi squared here, we end up with x being multiplied by u squared minus pi squared plus 1 for all of our x terms taken onto the right hand side now. And then similarly for our u's, we end up with u squared minus pi squared minus 1, all multiplied by u on our left hand side. So then we can just divide both sides by u squared minus pi squared plus 1. We see that our x coordinate then at this point we're interested in is u into u squared minus pi squared minus 1, all over u squared minus pi squared plus 1. Now we can find the y-coordinate of this point just by substituting in the x-coordinate into either of the line's equations. We'll go with L1 here. And just to avoid having fractions within fractions when we do the substitution, we'll do all in one big step. We substitute in the value of x, and we'll also multiply the top and bottom of the fraction by x's denominator, like this u squared minus pi squared plus 1. So this is going to give us now y is 2u plus pi 
And instead of x, we just keep the numerator, so u into u squared minus pi squared minus 1. And then we've got the plus pi, but this gets multiplied by x's denominator, so it's plus pi u squared minus pi squared plus 1. So that's our new numerator for y. Then the denominator, we keep y's denominator, so the u plus pi all squared plus 1. Then this is all being multiplied by x's denominator, so we multiply the top and bottom by u squared minus pi squared plus 1. So this gives us a new expression for y. So we'll keep this 2 times u plus pi term and this u squared minus pi squared plus 1 term. We'll just take these to one side and focus on simplifying the rest for now. So we've got 2 u plus pi over u squared minus pi squared plus 1. We'll write the remaining terms just in a separate fraction, but we can actually do some more here. So we've got u squared minus pi squared repeating here. So we'll write this as we can have this u squared minus pi squared as u plus pi u minus pi but we've also got a u plus pi term here as well. So it's a factor of u plus pi multiplied by u plus pi times u minus pi. So we end up with u plus pi squared times u minus pi, and you've also got a minus u from the u times minus one, and a plus pi from the pi times positive one. So minus u plus pi. So that's our numerator, having simplified some of this, and we'll leave alone the u plus pi all squared plus one term. So you can start to see here actually if we take out a factor of u minus pi, if we just leave this term, I'll just write dot dot dot, we leave this fraction alone, take out a factor of u minus pi from the numerator, you see you get u plus pi all squared, and then minus u plus pi, if you multiply this just by minus one, you get u minus pi. So we end up with something that looks really nice because the denominator u plus pi all squared minus 1 is actually a factor of the numerator. So all of this will cancel, just leaving us with our u minus pi term there. So this dot 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 was 2, and it's u plus pi times u minus pi. So we can actually write this as 2 u squared minus pi squared, using the difference of two squares again. And this is all over u squared minus pi squared plus 1. So this gives us a nice expression then in terms of u for the y coordinate this point we're interested in. So now we've found nice expressions for the x and y coordinates in terms of this parameter u. So the only question remaining to answer is which values can u actually take? So how far can we move this circle before it breaks this rule that the in-circle circumference is equal to the length of this side on the x-axis? Well you can see just looking at these that for a certain value of u, so that u squared minus pi squared plus 1 is equal to 0. For a certain value of u that satisfies this, we'll get a denominator of 0. So as we approach this value of u, our x and y coordinates will both converge to infinity. So it seems like this critical value of u is what we should be looking for. So u squared is going to be equal to pi squared minus 1. So we're looking for u equals plus or minus the square root of pi squared minus 1 as our two critical values. So you can't take a value equal to each of these, but if we were to take u equal to either of these, then we would actually get our two lines would be parallel and would never meet. So this would sort of correspond to the case of a triangle where one side length is perhaps zero and the other two sides coincide with each other, or it's an infinite version where one side length is finite and the other two are infinite. But just to conclude then, we can say that we've got our x and y coordinates where u is less than the square root of pi squared minus 1, and u also has to be greater than the negative of the square root of pi squared minus 1.